Good morning. Доброе утро. It is a great pleasure for me to greet you here in Helsinki to say hello to all the members and the guests of the General Assembly of the EU Russian Civil Society Forum. It is a remarkable gathering of people that are like-minded and want to work for the civil society beyond the borders, which is the mission of the EU Russia Civil Society Forum. Great pleasure to see you all this morning. My name is Anna Sivortian and I am Executive Director of the EU Russia Civil Society Forum and I will walk you through a few technical announcements and then introduce you to the day because we have lots of things planned for today, tomorrow and Friday two and a half days of the General Assembly here in Helsinki, Finland. Great pleasure. Well, first of all, headphones. By now, if you need headphones, you probably get your own set. I only want to add that uh, this is somebody's property, so we ask you to be very, very uh, mindful about the headsets. Then, um, for those that haven't yet registered, we have lots of printed material and uh, something to support you during the discussions uh, those three days. So please see my colleagues at the registration, see our wonderful bunch of volunteers coming from Finland um, and our international team for your pack. And I'm sure you would find lots of interesting uh, printouts uh, and publications there. Well, last but not least, uh, this is a very special assembly for us. Um, and I think this is the greenest general assembly. Um, and our standards for uh, being environmentally friendly, uh, um, I think, uh, definitely raised this year because of being here in Finland. And our Finnish partners that uh, helped a lot with organizing this assembly, Association Kihus, uh, was tirelessly working on raising our standards. So you, every each of you, would have a USB stick and uh, lots of files that would support you in discussions are already on those USB sticks. This is some beautiful wood. Please check out the software, though. Uh, there's really lots about the forum and uh, documents that are needed for the external and internal discussions. Well, another thing, an ecopan, and it has a hashtag, GA Helsinki. If you're an active social media user, please use the hashtag so we can track ourselves and see well, what digital trace we're leaving, at least. But I hope that, of course, people in this audience are leaving a societal track, if you will. Obviously, trying to work and make uh, communities uh, more prosperous, better off. <laughs> Hashtag G Helsinki. At the same time, it would be very helpful, of course, if you're an active social media user, that you put your phone and your electronic devices on uh, some quiet mode, silent mode, so that we're not interrupted, uh, and specifically the work of the interpreters and the work of the live streaming is not interrupted by all those beautiful melodies that you have as ringtones. That would be very helpful. Uh, well, this is pretty much it on the technical side. There's a bunch of bathrooms already in this room. I'm sure that might be needed. There's waters. And my colleagues from the Secretariat of the Eurasian Civil Society Forum will be happy. Uh, you will probably know them by now, but a lot of information to guide you through the day would be coming from uh, my colleagues uh, Ville Tupurainen and Kristina smolinina -Weiten. And actually all of us. So feel yourself at home here in Helsinki for those three days. Well, for the first day of the assembly, we have quite a few discussions planned, and I want to say that that's a very special uh, year when we're having the seventh 
General Assembly, the symbolism of 2017, I think, needs no explanation for many people in this room, for your own reasons, though. So for some people, this is 100 years of a big change. For some years, it's 100 years of a revolution. For some years, that's 500 years of reformation. It's really a lot of symbolism this year, and we know that this is an ex extremely challenging year politically and societally for all of us. So this is why we're here, to discuss what we can be doing, what we can be doing together in this EU-Russia setup that is becoming increasingly, um, well, I wouldn't say problematic, but challenging to live in, and uh, I hope that we'll be looking at opportunities during those three days of what can be still done uh, or what opportunities arise, uh, though the political start of the year uh, is definitely troubling, not just on the European level, but I would say on the world level. Uh, it is a crucial year for the e Russia Civil Society Forum, and here we have representatives of 110 of 150 member organizations of the forum. So definitely a huge wealth of knowledge, people coming from over 20 countries, including Russia and the EU countries. So please take this chance to immerse yourself in the very international setting of like-minded people. And uh, we will start today with a discussion about, again, 2017 and 100 years of independence of Finland and how this 100 years helped shape the civil society in Finland. We will then smoothly progress to the launch of the civil society report. That's a new product by the e Russia Civil Society Forum. And we will look at five countries and some bigger trends and game changers. And uh, after lunch, we will be talking about, again, something extremely topical, the rise, the rise of uh, nationalism, conservatism, and the changing borders and agenda for Europe. Um, well, we need to understand the world around us, so that's uh, why we set up the program for the day uh, in this particular way. Uh, at the end of the day, the working groups of the forum will have a chance to see each other, to have uh, discussions in the breakout rooms, and we conclude the day with a reception at the House of Estates. Uh, it's just a short walk from here, and everybody is cordially invited. This is courtesy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland, and at this point I should thank not just all of you who took very precious time to come here and be with us in this room, but of course uh, organizations and people who made it all possible. Uh, and by our donors, I would really understand, well, in the first place, maybe lots of volunteers that are working here and that have been working uh, for this event to happen, but uh, obviously our uh, established uh, donors. And you would see the list of them on this beautiful program for the General Assembly, again, emphasizing your back. And we're extremely grateful to the European Commission, Ministry of the Foreign Affairs of Finland, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Robert Bosch Stiftung, Oak Foundation, and a number of foundations and individuals that help to bring you all here. And we're obviously very grateful to uh, the organization that is hosting the Secretariat throughout quite a few years, German Russian Exchange. This is our sit in Berlin. Um, and uh, grateful to Deutsche Welle, uh, which is our official media partner for this event. So quite likely that you will be interviewed by them, and there's a bunch of journalists around in this room. Crucial year for the forum, crucial year for all of us. Forum is on the verge of becoming an independent organization. We've been uh, 
a network of organizations for uh, six odd years. And uh, 2017 is symbolic and important for us because we will be discussing the way of legal incorporation of the forum. So my big call on forum members, please be present for tomorrow's sessions. This is largely an internal day for the forum members where you would be making some important decisions about the future and development and institutionalization of the forum. So we really count on your active presence uh, on that day. And well, knowing how uh, crucial the elections are and how unpredictable they are, the whole 2016 proved that you know you never know this is totally art more than science and this is probably the last announcement that i'm making uh, there will be an election to the steering committee of the forum 10 people that help navigate uh, through all those sometimes muddy sometimes clean waters uh, around uh, uh, well that in that sea where we are at the moment so if you feel like nominating someone or self-nominating to be at the steering committee to help us govern, to help us do great things, uh, well, there's a chance. Uh, and on your USB sticks, you would find uh, a nomination form. Please fill it in. Leave it with my colleagues. It can be sent by email. It can be just given out. Um, there's plenty of opportunities for you to run. We have two slots on the Russian side and two slots on the European side this year. And yes, please make the right choice. This is now a chance for the uh, EU Russia Civil Society Forum. Uh, we know that the choices last year and the upcoming choices in some of the countries uh, are definitely posing uh, a lot of questions at the moment. So, well, this is uh, your moment to vote for the people that will uh, help us get to uh, the civil society beyond the borders, maybe in the longer term. Without further ado, I want to thank you all for listening to the introduction. Uh, again, there's lots of uh, things that we want you to participate in, quiz, site visits, you can register over there, there's a black door, but we will be guiding you uh, step by step through everything that we have planned for you. And now I would like to give the floor to somebody very special to uh, the forum, uh, and that's someone who was supporting forum for many years and was at the founding assembly in Prague in 2011. Mr. Karl Schwarzenberg, chairman of the foreign committee of the Czech parliament, minister of foreign affairs of the Czech Republic in the years 2007 through 2009, and uh, 2010 and 13, Czech Republic. Mr. Schwarzenberg, we're happy to welcome you at this stage. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, I'm really very glad to be here and to come to this meeting. And because in these five years since this forum was founded, the situation in Europe and in the world has changed a bit. And I'm one thing I'm convinced more and more that civil society, NGOs, are more important than ever. I must say that when Václav Havel, who was always pro promoting civil society, declared it the most important thing, I had been rather conservative uh, in my political views, had my doubts about it. But we realize now that he 
analyze the situation correctly. If we look through Europe, we see an interesting phenomenon that practically in all countries, the traditional political parties are losing their position in influence form of parties who really were great and important in the history of this country, slowly getting smaller and so on, losing their memberships and so on. And instead of them, they're rising different movements, sometimes calling themselves movements, sometimes party too, uh, of a different type. Uh, one, we have a lot of extreme nationalists throughout Europe, and evidently gaining support in elections, and probably we will have in a few years them in most governments of the European countries. Uh, Second, not even extreme nationalists, but purely uh, populist or demagogist parties built on one or two oligarchs with a lot of money, with no clear program, uh, no definitive aims, but gaining a lot of support. The traditional party structure in Europe is slowly dissolving. And now, I do think that the, the rising populist and demagogic parties and the rising of extreme nationalist party is a great danger. I mean, I'm an old man, lamentably, uh, so I can remember what these ideologies did to Europe, how they destroyed Europe in the 30s and 40s. 50s of the 20th century. Um, and Karl Marx, who was a good historian, less good economist, um, was correct when he said that each historical tragedy uh, repeats itself as a, as a comedy. And of course, the present nationalist leaders all over Europe are not as such monsters and not as big as in the 30s and 40s, but they're enough to be a danger for Europe, they're enough uh, to destroy the European Union, and uh, uh, enough important uh, to destroy their own nation's fortune. Uh, for this, they have still sufficient strength and force. And in, th in this situation, it is a civil society who is a really important opposition to this development. They are only who are a really a counterweight. It is very interesting for me that um, the new authoritarian, semi-authoritarian regimes in Europe uh, um, don't fight anymore so much with political parties as their opponents. But they attack the whole times NGOs and civil society. Evidently, they are convinced that, for instance, uh, Mr. Soros is a greater danger to authoritarian regimes than their own opposition parties. And therefore we see all over the, uh, Europe and east of it the same reaction to NGOs who are active and to the civil society. I'm, I do think that we will go through a period, I don't know what the end result of this development is, but where really the political structures which developed up to us that's the key from the French Revolution, but definitely from the second half of the 19th century, where European political life was built on political parties, that evidently, and these parties had some ideological difference, beginning the first were the liberal parties and developed the social democrats, Christian democrats, also the conservatives and so on, that that all is 
going to a natural end as everything human and, and everything uh, which people invented has a natural end. And we are coming to the age where I don't know how to look, but I, don't, I know that we can have a bright future only if we engage as citizens, if each of us knows that he's responsible for his fate, for the fate of his children, of his grandchildren, and act according to it. That is the core of civil society. And only if we engage in different structures, everybody must know where, do we, uh, where he could be useful. Not everybody must go in politics, uh, ecological, economic, uh, artist activities, all that. But only if we have a dense network of these different uh, NGOs, we can develop an some resistance uh, to the new forces who try again uh, to overrule us and, uh, and to establish a firm rule of us. By the way, there are not so few voices in Europe who are calling for strength hand that the democratic system is over, the, that we need uh, authoritarian rule to compete with it's a uh, power of the future, like China and so on. I do think it's a disastrous development for the whole Europe, because we would le lose the sense of our being, the sense of the whole European development. And of course, we should always acknowledge too that the traditional quarrels in European politics between democratic and la, uh, right and left loses only its importance. First, um, because it's really necessary in such times that those who are democrats, if they have liberal or conservative or Christian democracy or social democracy convictions, must stick together. And second, because the differences get less and less. Let's be honest. Do you know in, in the Western Europe, uh, any social democrat politician who really engaged in the ideas of social democracy, do you know uh, a People's Party of the European People Party, a politic who is really uh, interested in the Christian or Catholic uh, social teaching? No. And to be honest, you can interchange the politicians of the different democratic parties. <coughs> the same faces, the same phrases, the same reactions, and so on. There's really very little difference uh, between them. And that of, that, of course, is one cause of the downfall, because the traditional democratic parties became boring. They don't have answers for the new time, and there is no new political ideas which they offer uh, to their supporters. The last great political idea which was invented in Europe is 50 years ago, and that was the Green Movement. Since then, nothing new has appeared. And of course, as we know, uh, if you take a sachet of tea, if you try to make the tea, the third cup of tea, with the same such as it, it is really tasty. And that is the same as in politics. If we repeat the ideas of the 19th century all over again, we, we don't impress the young people or anybody. And that's one of the many reasons of the crisis of the traditional democracy uh, in Europe. But of course, uh, maybe this traditional democratic forms will disappear, but that doesn't mean that we sh should stop fighting for democracy. Democracy is a basic human right, and we have to fight for human rights under whatever condition. And no, nobody should explain to us that there are forms of culture who don't need human rights, and, the, and that there are more progressive regimes in the world 
which of course lack democracy, but look at their success where they are. You should look at the condition of the people living in, in such states. So I do think those who engage in, in civil society, in NGOs today, they have even greater work and greater responsibility before them than 20, 30 years ago, or even when we, seven years ago, founded this movement in Prague. And of course, I spoke here mostly, I admit, of the other side of the EU-Russia forum, to, to show you that the political crisis, the democratic crisis, is not only a problem of Russia, but a problem of, of Europe too. But of course, everybody, uh, who watches politics is scared about the rising development of authoritarian rules and regimes in Russia proper, in the Russian Federation. And, uh, uh, and I'm deeply convinced that Russia, which is a wonderful country with an extremely gifted people, is only back for the, for the unhappy regimes they had during the last hundred years. Uh, otherwise, I think Russia will be one of the most modern countries in the world today. But politics play their role. Nevertheless, we have to live with the circumstances they are. And uh, again, as I told you in Western Europe too, it's interesting for me is that and the reactions of the Russian government and leadership, they never react to practically to any opposition party in Russia. They don't play a real role, but where they are very sensitive is about civil society, about NGOs. With a sound instinct of an autocrat, they know where the real danger is. The real danger is if the citizens organize themselves if they don't wait till the political party leadership calls them to act, but act autonomously on each place in its own responsibility. So as I, to finish, now we, our job, civil society, our job as members of NGOs, active in all these things we developed in the last, is much more important than ever in the last 30, 50 years. It's now up to us to save democracy and liberty in Europe. God bless us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwarzenberg. And, um, well, uh, Civil society more important than ever, the role more crucial than ever, and 100 years that could have been spent very differently. Uh, this is where we lead to the next discussion. Um, and in that, we want to really symbolically connect EU in Russia. For some of us, this is the first day of the General Assembly, and. Uh, there was a group of four members that had a very intense program uh, in St. Petersburg this Monday. Uh, discussions along the lines of what we would be talking through, but in Russia. And we really felt this is an important signal to send, just as uh, Mr. Schwarzenberg told us, uh, that we would keep as a forum, as a uh, community, to organize things and exercise the freedom of speech and discuss all the important and pressing topics wherever we are, both in Russia and in the EU, equally addressing everything that burns and trying to find solutions. So this is the session that would, in a way, give us this feel of what's on the other side. And uh, I'm very pleased to invite the panelists and the moderators of the panel because they introduce, uh, they represent exactly those two sides, Russia and Finland. 
a very quick ride on the railway, but two different realities. And now we would learn how civil society is able to develop itself in 100 years of independent works. Uh, please welcome uh, Mauri Ruhonin, Finnish Association for Mental Health Finland, and Anna Skvartsova, NGO Development Center. Uh, Anna is also steering committee member, and uh, Marita and Anna would introduce the speakers of the panel. We have two hours to discuss Focus Finland, 100 years of civil society evolution. Good morning, dear colleagues, participants of conference. We would like to invite also our panelists. Marita, we need some panelists, I think, yeah, not only I agree, two of us. Really. <laughs> Okay, good morning, all of you, dear colleagues and uh, friends and uh, guests, conference participants. I'm very happy to be here, and this is a great honor to be moderating this uh, session of one and a half an hour dealing with the Finnish situation concerning NGOs and civil society. And in 100 years, we have a, a good uh, history here in Finland also. Mr. Schwarzenberg mentioned that civil society is even more important now than ever because the world is changing a lot, as all of us know. Uh, my background is uh, 30 years work in NGOs, in non-governmental organizations, and the last uh, duty I had, it was the, in Finnish Association for Mental Health until uh, 2016. And I was also a member of a board of Finnish-Russian NGO network, which was active in 1999 uh, to 2006 or 7. About that, we have had quite silent here in Finland in this issue nowadays. But uh, for the first, I want to introduce Anna Skvartsova, who is uh, who is um, like a heart of this work in 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 Finland used to be, we, ha we have known each other a long time and, and Anna has worked a lot for these issues and, and also for this seminar. So uh, Anna is uh, executive director of NGO Development Center in St. Petersburg and coordinator of, uh, she used to be coordinator of uh, Finnish-Russian NGO network in, in 1999 to 2007. And she's a member of the steering committee of EU-Russia Civil Society Forum. And we, both of us, we hope that we shall have very fruitful session and lively discussions. Timetable is a problem, as you see already in the beginning, but we try to tackle that. And uh, uh, now I invite panelists here. Do we have enough chairs? Yes, we have. Please come here. Uh, Aaro Harju, Rilli Lappalainen, Sarri Nykänen and Riitta Salin. Welcome our panelists. Now uh, we shall have, uh, for, for the first, Anna will tell you about the background of this uh, uh, panel discussion uh, and a bit about the background of Finnish NGOs and civil society. Please, Anna. Uh, dear colleagues, when we planned our seventh general assembly in um, Helsinki, in Finland, and in 2017, uh, of course, um, uh, we thought about the 100 year of independence of Finland, and uh, we asked our Finnish colleagues uh, to share with us 
what input had independence of Finland to a development of civil society. Uh, and I would like uh, to ask colleagues from Secretariat to uh, put slide with two historical documents uh, that were published in uh, 1917. Uh, it is Declaration of Independence, uh, Independency of Finland, um, uh, created by uh, independent uh, Finnish parliament in December 1917 and the resolution of Council of People's Commissars of Russian Soviet Republic because uh, Russian Soviet Republic was the first state who officially uh, accepted uh, independent uh, Finnish state. But of course we will not concentrate on pure historical context of this important event. Uh, we will focus on evolution of civil society during this century. Because in Finland, in a country of 5.5 million of population inhabitants, there are around 135,000 uh, registered associations and big number of different unregistered citizens groups. And almost all citizens belong to at least one association during their life. The long tradition of organizational action is originally connected with the formation of civil society and of the Finnish of formation of Finnish nation in uh, the 19th century and with the birth of the state of Finland in 1917. Okay, thank you, Anna. Very interesting documents there. History is here. Uh, so we would like to cover in this panel four questions for our panelists, with our panelists. And those four questions are, for the first, what are the major developments in the civil society in Finland in the last hundred years? And then for the second, we shall talk about what is the key for this success in Finland, because I think all of us who are from Finland here for working or volunteering NGOs, so we can be very proud of, of this uh, civil society here. Mostly, I think. And then for the, for the third, which challenges do we have in Finland uh, nowadays and what are the prospects for the future and new solutions because we have to look at the future now also, not only history. Uh, Anna and me, we are glad to introduce to you our four speakers. Aro Harju on my right side uh, from Citizens Forum. Uh, Citizens Forum is a non-formal adult education association and uh, you also have your own study center. And Aro is a very well known and active expert on civil society and active citizenship, citizenship issues. And then uh, Rilli Lappalainen uh, from Kehus, Finnish NHDO platform for the EU brings together Finnish NGOs interested in sustainable development in all the levels and how different policies influence in poverty reduction. Very important issue. Kehus has a special interest on focus on European Union's work, but also in global work, especially in United Nations. Welcome. You also. And then Sari Nykänen. Uh, Founded of uh, I do of uh, I do uh, 2013, which is an interesting name. This uh, association, it's a new one, and Sari is new in this field. But you have worked also in other field of of civil society. I, I shall read your text here. Uh, it's a citizens initiative for equal marriage law, which was called Tahdon 2013. It was a big. Uh, big achievement in Finland uh, that enabled same-sex marriage in Finland. Also one of the founders, Sari is also one of the founders of the campaign Energia Remonti 2015, which promotes renewable energy and influenced the parliamentary e elections and governmental program in 2015. Welcome, Sari. And then Riitta Salin from Moniheli Network of Multicultural Associations, that is the biggest network combining multicultural associations in Finland. 
The network was, was founded in 2010, but has been growing rapidly. The current number of member associations being uh, 109. The member associations represent around 70 different ethic, uh, ethnic backgrounds or nationalities, all located in Finland. Okay, now we go to the first question for panelists. And, uh, and then we try to open the floor uh, after every question, every, every uh, issue for you in, uh, in audience and in, in, in for you as participants of this assembly. Timetable is a bit limited, but we really try to do that. Uh, the first question is, what are the major developments in the civil society field in Finland in this last hundred years? And uh, really, maybe you shall start. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you, Marita. You are working. No, if you can hear me now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks for the first question and, and, and thanks for anyway inviting us, first of all, to be the local partner in organizing this whole very important event, but also attending on, on this uh, panel. I really could say that it's a very, very fundamental part of the whole building, the whole nation in, in Finland. So there is some kind of uh, metaphor or saying that, that the, the whole Finland has been built by the civil society. And that really is the truth, because uh, in, in many times after the several wars, uh, the, really the civil society has really taken the responsibility to really building their, their family lives, but their society lives in, in the cities, uh, local areas where they, they lived, and also taking the a little bit larger responsibility on, on really building the whole, whole nation. So the ownership of being the active citizenship uh, has been started already uh, almost 100 years ago and has been developed on, in, in many, many cases. Uh, I, I could mention another point also which uh, has been influenced quite a lot on, on Finland as well, and especially amongst of the civil society organizations happened in the 90s where we have uh, both the, we have the struggle with the economics on, on that time, but then at the same time also there, there happened a little bit trendy issue in, in civil society organizations that there came a lot of professionalism to the picture in the NGOs. So many NGOs also see that there is still the, some kind of fundamental situation, stable part of, of the whole society, and they wanted to really make it as a profession and really make it seriously, and then really having the long-term perspectives and strategies more likely in, in uh, organizing and um, implementing the actions what we have believed that are most important for the Finnish society. And then perhaps the third point during these 100 years is that now we are having a little bit feeling at the moment that this so-called third sector, where especially um, many of the, the uh, politicians are putting us as a civil society, uh, we are really feeling that it's not anymore taken so seriously what it used to be. And at the moment, especially during this government time, there has been quite a heavy cuts on, on the actions and the work that the civil society is doing and implementing. And we feel quite strongly at the moment that we are now living a different time of, of, of the history at the moment. And we, uh, we really see the, the cuts what are really happening. What is really happening for the next 100 years, I think that that's the last part of, of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, really. Maybe, Rita, could you go on? Yes. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being invited here as well. A um, couple of things that really already mentioned here. Um, I'm not uh, going to talk so much about the history. I'm not an expert of that, but I'm talking about my own history in NGO life, which is covers the last 20 years and now the, the last five years in that uh, network of, of multicultural associations. And um, as it was already said um, by Marita there at the beginning that our network covers more than 100 um, uh, multicultural associations who have um, 
who have uh, or are representing more than 70 ethnic backgrounds or 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 nationalities and it means that there are a lot of different sides where we should go and what should be the 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 main main ways to 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 go on and and uh, that kind of things but uh, somehow we have managed to keep it together uh, during the last years uh, uh, the last three years or so, we have got so many new members, and uh, we have been growing so rapidly. And maybe that's a sign of that that uh, our work has been seen important, and and uh, um, it has an influence. And many migrants who have moved here into Finland seen it as a way of of influencing, and uh, that has been the the beginning, the 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 main thing behind when uh, this whole, whole network was established that the, the migrants and uh, people who have been more like object, they turn to be subjects in their own issues. They start taking care of, the, of, of planning their own life, uh, the services they need and, and that kind of things. And that has been, that is going on all the time and, and uh, that is the main, the main uh, thinking there behind behind our network, but uh, what really mentioned here that uh, the NGOs here in Finland uh, uh, they are like um, they have become some sort of institutions in in many cases, even especially the bigger ones, and they have also taken the responsibility of of providing certain services, even so. Oh, well, or in in that large amount that, for example, in in many uh, areas, uh, for example, the cities and other uh, official uh, service providers, they have given given it to the to the NGOs that okay, uh, we do not have to take care of these and these services because the NGOs are taking care of this better, or or um, somehow the, the responsibility ability have been given given to NGOs and of course in a way that's good but then then on the other hand not always as, as good either and then uh, what about the cuts that has happened now during the 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 current government here in Finland of course I think that the EU institutions and the NGOs working with the EU issues and and with the with the foreign issues they they have met that um, more profoundly than we, for example, uh, I need to say that in 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 that field where where uh, our associations come from, the the uh, fundings have not been cut, at least not yet. Um, on the other, um, I need to say that it's the the case is just just opposite that, and and the funding that the migrant associations have got during the last years, it has actually it has been growing. But of course, um, you, you can only wait for what is going to happen. And, and of course, this is not the issue, not, or, or the, not, not only here in, in Finland and what, what happens in the political life in, in, in Finland, but on the worldwide, as, as we have learned now during the last weeks. But that's pretty much what I have to say here at, at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rita. And then, uh, Sari, please. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, well, I would like to talk about a rather recent development in civil society. Um, now, currently in Finland, there's a possibility to do a citizen's initiative, which means that as a citizen, you can propose a law to parliament if you can, within six months, gather 50,000 support statements for that. Um, so this has been possible since 2011 through a change in the constitution and uh, what this has meant for me personally is that it sent me off on a rather exciting journey a few years ago uh, when I together with a friend, um, her idea, um, decided to make a citizen's initiative on same-sex marriage um, and we were joined by around 167,000 others and uh, luckily the law is now changing and beginning from March it will uh, enter into force. 
But what these citizens' initiatives represent for society, I think it's a very powerful tool for direct democracy, and it's greatly contributing to the opportunities that citizens have in this society and how civil society can influence legislation. Yes. So thank you, Sari. Uh, you took up very very interesting question, but we shall go to that uh, later, which is so so big, uh, so great, uh, great uh, initiative possible in Finland. But now, Aro Harju, please, your turn. Thank you very much for invitation to this in interesting conference. Civil society is a big issue in Finland, and it takes at least one day to explain what, what is it. But now I have five minutes time, so I take only two, three points. One of my colleagues said once that without civil society, Finland here is in North Cold in Europe would be very silent, quiet place. So we are very, very important in Finnish life and people's life here in, in, in Finland. You can understand, 5 million people, 15 million people are members in associations. Nearly 1 million Finnish make voluntary work regularly, regularly. So these are big numbers. The second point, Finnish civil society is typically the same model than in other Nordic countries, especially in Sweden and Denmark, not so much in Norway or Iceland. And we have associations and we have legislation background of this, of this uh, activities here. And we have one specialty only in Nordic countries, only in Finland, if you compare to other European countries, non-formal adult education is important part of Finnish civil society. This is very unique. One million Finnish study every year in adult education institutions or centers in Finland. That is a big issue in our country. Third point, terrible wars has been important points in our civil society history. Civil society started flourishing 1880s. After that, it was a little depression. After independent 1917, we had triple civil war in Finland. Brother against brother, sister against sister. After that, Finnish civil society divided nearly totally because people divided in Finland. It was the, after that, it was the, the own workers' associations near socialism. And on the other side, it was so-called bourgeoisie so associations and their own members. They couldn't work together, make together. And it lasted nearly to the end of 20th century. Can you imagine that? It was so big divide. And after Second World War II, we had, after that, it was big flourishing. Young men came back from war to their own countrysides. It started flourishing. It was no TV, no automobile, no mobile phones. It was flourishing. And after that, it has been excellent history in Finland, very much activities. And civil society, and associations are in every field in Finnish society. Not only sport, youth work, but only commercial defense and different kind of, of field. So this is very special. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. You took up very important questions and now I must turn to Anna to tell, uh, to ask if we have some time for a discussion of, after the, this. Do you think we have some five minutes to discuss about that? Okay, good. Uh, 
I wrote up some some uh, uh, themes that you took up. Uh, really talked about uh, how important, uh, how whole our society has been built by civil society, civil society. How how all whole Finland, all this hundred year history has been built, and and Aro talked about this. Uh, uh, historical events that divided our people to two parts which couldn't work together and, and which uh, has, uh, has influences a uh, very long time. And then uh, there came two issues that I want to mention. Rita talked about NGOs having become more like institutions and uh, taken the role of service providers, which is uh, issue of criticism, I think, also. And Sari talked about citizens initiative, which is a good, a very important tool nowadays for civil society. But now, I don't talk more because I'd like to give the floor, floor for you. We have uh, some time for, for maybe a couple of questions, and I hope this uh, first round has, uh, wo has uh, uh, given you some ideas to to put a question to panelists. Okay, maybe you should wait for the mic. Micro. Uh, please take the microphone. Hello. Finnish NGO участвует в законодательных. Do Finnish NGOs uh, take part, uh, make uh, legislative initiatives? Um, can Finnish NGOs uh, put forward initiatives, uh, leg uh, legislative initiatives? Legislative initiatives. Who wants yes, to what? answer? Yeah. Aro wants to answer, please. We take part very actively because we work very near connection to the state, to the municipalities. And some other, for example, when I have gave lectures in, in Europe, for example, in Britain, they have criticized very much that, hey, are you total, uh, are you independent <laughs> associations because you are working so near to the state? I said, of course, we are independent, but we have influence in Finnish society. Okay, some other answers. Really, please. Yeah, indeed. I'm, I'm just saying the same what um, Aro mentioned, that yes, indeed, we work quite uh, hand in hand. But I would say that it's a critical hand in hand going on. So we are still having our watchdog role. Mm -hmm. So definitely we will do that. But we really see that it's uh, if we really would like to make the impact and really get our, our goals and targets to be implemented, we need to go hand in hand. We can't really be just critical, but we need to give the solutions or, or some kind of guidance as well. As well. Uh, we have been quite regularly invited also to the parliament on, on the hearings in special committees and, and giving our opinion what we see about, especially on the, for example, in the global policies quite often. And I really see that it's, it's, uh, it's absolutely fundamental part of the democracy that we have the channels to be heard. Okay, thank you. We are a small country with only five million people, and that's, uh, that's why we can do that. Yeah. We know each other very yeah. well. Yeah. Rita, please. Yeah, pretty much the same that the, was said here already, but I think that every seriously taken association has the responsibility to, to, uh, to be active in when, when there is a new law or the legislation going on and take part in those hearings and, and give statements and, and be active in that, that sense as well, because the opportunities, they are always organized. You have the, you have the opportunities, you just need to, to take use of them. Thank you, and thank you for the question. It, it was a very important question. Now I see one hand there. Okay, you already have the microphone. Yeah. Sorry, you were the first. <laughs> Please. Uh, my name is Mary Chertok from uh, CAF Russia. Uh, I wonder if any of you could give, um, could give us an idea of the state of uh, philanthropy and charitable giving in Finland, because that's the other side of civil society. If civil society organizations can be supported from the citizens, not from the government. It gives them uh, another level of independence. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Who wants to take that? Could 
you repeat? What, what uh, is, could you please repeat? I think it was not very clear for us. Yeah. Uh, I, I was asking about the state of philanthropy and charitable giving, the charitable. funding side okay. of civil society, okay. Okay. the funding which, which doesn't go from the state, from okay. the government, but goes from uh, citizens, I don't know, wealthy people, companies, uh, and which ensures independence uh, of civil society. Okay, thank you for repeating. Now we catched it. And Aro wants to start, or really wants to start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, there, exactly, there was some research about that, that when, uh, when the f economical situation in the country is bad, the citizens give more. So that's exactly their statistics about that, that that really happens. So somehow the people feel more common, and, and that is, is the tendency at, at the moment in, in Finland. And we have a quite long tradition, that especially uh, when there are humanitarian crises in the world, people are giving quite a lot. So, uh, for example, at the moment, the case in Syria, it is really, really people know about that. They want to participate somehow, and, and one of the ways to participate is to donate. But, of course, at the, at the same time, there are some other possibilities as well to participate. But, in, indeed, fin Finnish people are, are quite good in, in, in that. Of course, there's always... As you know, there's a lot of need on, on that, but in, in that case, if you're comparing Finland for many other countries, we are quite on, on the top on the list. Any other panelists? Rita? Yeah, um, yeah that, that is pretty much the case, that, that actually Finnish people are quite ready to, <laughs> to, to give some funding, uh, but, but from the association point of view, that is uh, quite often a bit bit difficult in that sense as well that it normally goes to those big very big uh, very uh, national level um, working uh, big institution institutions or organizations and the big uh, the smaller ones do not actually get nothing out of it so it does not actually help the funding of of the smaller associations at all okay thank you for very good questions now I have to cut. I'm sorry. I saw. I see some hands, but okay. If Anna allows, so then I can. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Anna. I see all the hands, but I think it's your turn now. Please. <laughs> I just have the microphone. I think I'm lucky, but uh, uh, Barbara von Freitag, I have a question with these very impressive historical documents, and because we are here to discuss EU-Russia relations. Um, of course, the history of the long border between uh, Finland and uh, Russia is a very, very special one. And there was war in 39, and it was all very complicated uh, in 41 to 45. Um, when did uh, commitment to Russia resurface in uh, Finland in the civil society sector? Is it only since 89, or has it been a long history to still stay engaged uh, despite difficult history? And what are the main, the main focuses in Finland when you look to um, when you look to Russia in the on the societal level, and where is the engagement focusing? Thank you for the question. Uh, who wants to answer that? I think Anna is good to answer that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the same that maybe I can start, and mm. also uh, there are people that also can participate. Uh, maybe a bit later uh, to answer this important question because um, actually as, as, uh, as much as I know uh, a big interest to uh, what is happening in uh, Russian civil society uh, was started in uh, the beginning of 90s uh, uh, in the middle of 90s uh, when uh, Finnish NGOs initiated three big uh, Finnish NGOs initiated a project that was um, uh, called uh, Pietari Projekti, uh, Petersburg Project, because it started with uh, St. Petersburg. And uh, they heard that uh, there is something very interesting uh, happening at that time in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia about the rise of um, many, many NGOs. And they just came to St. Petersburg and suggest uh, cooperation. Uh, and uh, it was a start of uh, big, more than, uh, I think it was maybe 13 or 14 years, uh, cooperation project between Finnish and Russian NGOs. 
uh, that was called in, in Finnish Sosialia Tervoisjärjestön Venäjä Verkosto. It was social and health um, care NGOs, uh, Russian, Russian network. And uh, more than 40 NGOs was uh, uh, involved in this network. Uh, and they, they cooperated in nine sectors, um, in s uh, social and health sector. It was um, uh, homeless people, child care and family uh, um, in difficult living situation, um, cancer, those NGOs who work uh, with uh, cancer patients, diabetes, um, de uh, chemical dependencies uh, and um, addicts and so on. And, it was uh, actually exciting uh, work because uh, the, the, maybe the most exciting was that when specialists from those two countries uh, met, uh, it, was, it, it seemed like there were no borders at all because they understood very well each other. Of course, context is very different, uh, leg legislation, infrastructure, but uh, the work of the specialist on the level of work with clients it was uh, really very, very understand, easy to understand. Uh, so um, I remember my, that I was very surprised when I uh, f um, first time heard about this uh, initiative in the 90s, uh, that uh, the time in St. Petersburg al almost nobody knew about Finnish NGOs, Finnish, Finnish uh, civil society. Uh, there was much more initiatives from United States, from Germany and other countries, but somehow Finland, who is uh, our neighbor, was not so well uh, known. Uh, so we somehow broke this um, <laughs> barrier, and uh, even if um, when this program was stopped, but uh, good uh, um, relationships and cooperation between uh, our NGOs um, uh, continue and the most important is that many good social innovations started at the time in St. Petersburg but it was not only that some, somebody copied what you do but it was like that people digest and, and uh, did it uh, their own way. Thank you Anna, uh, I agree with you, we have experienced the same years with you and already in, in, the, in the end of the uh, 80s there were many NGOs in Finland who used to work with some, uh, some NGOs in, in Russia uh, or in, uh, on, in Soviet Union at that time. So, for example, my own association, which was working with single mothers and their children. So we had cooperation and we kind of needed each other to be more strong there. Now I have to cut this and uh, turn to Anna for the next question. Please, Anna. Um, thank you, Marita. You have a question? Да, добрый день. The last question then. Последний вопрос, пожалуйста. Назовите, пожалуйста. Could you uh, list a number of uh, Finnish NGOs um, which are pressured by authorities? Uh, a list of NGOs in Finland who are repressed by uh, the government, by the state? No. Okay. Free country. Repressed, yes. Repressed. Persecuted. Persecuted. No. 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 No, we cannot. <laughs> we don't have we are free country. We don't have that kind of list or the state is not making that kind of activities. Only nowadays we have a discussion that, that you know, extreme nationalist, extreme right-wing association who has made violence. Now is discussion, can we deny their the, the activities in Finland? It's not easy for us because we have long, long tradition, more than 200 years, that people can freely come together. So we have different realities. I see, uh, I see your, your hand, but uh, please wait a bit. Uh, we will have uh, another possibility to uh, listen to you. Uh, let's um, ask our Finnish colleagues what is the key for this success? Because as you said um, um, uh, earlier that 
There is one million Finns volunteering. There is one million Finns who uh, are involved in regular civic ed education. And uh, also, really, you said that Finland itself was built um, uh, by civil society. So, uh, and probably this development was not smooth, but uh, it's successful. And uh, probably it's not successful only uh, because, as Marita said, that it's a small country. <laughs> Maybe there are uh, some other secrets. So please share it with us. What is your secret of building such a strong uh, civil society? Is it me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um. Big question. <laughs> if I would know the answer, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here at all. So, but uh, I try to enlighten it somehow from my point of view. Uh, as it was mentioned here already, so this is a free country. We have the freedom to gather, and, uh, and it's a legalized way to meet people with the same kind of thinking, with the same kind of, of goals. And um, it's a legalized way to be heard. It's a legalized way to influence. And if, of course, uh, if there's a group pressuring or, or, um, or raising out uh, s uh, some issues, it's always more, more heavier than, than uh, one, one single person, for example. So I think those are pretty much the, the keys for the, for the success of, of this uh, uh, civil society uh, life here in, in Finland. Of course, um, my background is, is there with the, with the mi migrant associations, and uh, especially for, for people coming from totally different kind of cultures, for example, where all that kind of activism is, is um, not seen very well, or, or it's even uh, not legal. Or so uh, so um, they are often um, big difficulties to understand that it's it's actually possible here in Finland. You can gather, you can you can have meetings, you can um, you can do all kind of things without being put on the blacklist, or or uh, you, you can vote, you can you can be socially active, you can um, you can join in in whatever political party you want to without being um, being. Um, Put on the on the blacklist, or we are without being uh, afraid of, of of your life or or your family's life or whatever. So I think that it comes out of that. And then, of course, the newcomers when they actually understand and realize that all ki that kind of things are, are possible here in Finland, I think that's a, a very very big thing for 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 many newcomers as well. But then. Uh, Shortly about that voluntarism, uh, which is uh, quite quite typical for Finns, and especially that uh, that was seen then um, a year ago or uh, at the end of 2015 when we got that uh, 30,000 refugees coming, um, all the asylum seekers coming from all over the, all over the world. Normally we have around 6,000 or even less of those per per year, and then. On that uh, certain year, we got uh, 32,000 of, of refugees coming over, and then, especially at that point, when help was needed, all kind of of um, very practical help was needed. So there was a very, very big, big, uh, um, or there were so many people who actually wanted to to volunteer. They wanted to give their time. They wanted to give. Uh, Clothes. They wanted to give money. They wanted to to have um, to be active in 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 that issue at that point. But of course, it has now go down a bit a bit. But I think that that when there is a big things happening, then people see that uh, okay, I have time. I have uh, I have the possibility to do that. So I'm going to do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rita. Who would like to continue? Sorry. Thanks. Finland has also greatly benefited from a culture of consensus and dialogue. That's always been an aim 
um, in politics, or it frequently is in politics and in civil society. Um, people aim to reach a consensus, they don't always reach it, but uh, even more important is the act of aiming for that, finding a mutually beneficial solution, because it requires dialogue if it's meant to be something more than a mere compromise. Um, so this dialogue means that people listen, listen to each other also if they differ in opinions and um, thus by aiming for such a consensus all the time the society collaborates so politics is not only about competition which it is in some cultures I would say that um, the winning party will dominate entirely and this creates this effect where parties become complete enemies of each other and leads to polarization as well um, and polarization is always a threat to collaboration and now currently that's also a challenge of Finland facing polarization which is now occurring recently. Thank you and we will have this uh, next round about the challenges and new responses so it will be good if you can continue then a bit later. Yes, I see really please. Yes, key for the success. I, I think that it's, uh, it is somehow part of, of this historical perspective because I think that we are used to work together. And I, I totally agree with, with Sarri about this consensus thinking. Uh, that is really the aim. It will take sometimes a little bit more time, but in the end, everybody really wants to find the solution. So that's, that's one of, of the key issues. And I, I think that one part of this heritage as well is that because we have the tradition to do and, and be partis, part of, uh, participatory and, and really active to building the society, it really goes from the generation to the other one. So it's in that way it's a part of our DNA, if we want that or not, it's still as a part of us. And I, I think that it's, it's really the, some kind of heritage yeah, that you... you do that because your parents do that, your sisters do that, your brothers do that. You have the very positive feelings and memories and you have been participated from the, uh, from the early childhood already. And another point is also that that majority of the activities, if you want to be active or participate in the, in the sport or cultural issue or whatever, main, majority of those are also very local ones. You don't really have to uh, travel to the other side of, of the country to participate. Of course, there are those specific organizations who are doing the things, but majority of the things what you can participate in the society is really local ones. And it's, it's very easy access. And that really helps as well that you can really, really be involved on, on that. And then perhaps one, one thing is that, of course, it has always, not always been like the, the, all the numbers of the membership is increasing and all of that. But I would say that especially for the big organizations, they have learned to read the society and the trends as well. I can just take one, one example, which I, I used to be very active in, in my childhood and, and still is some, somehow, is, is the scouts. And, and there has been up and downs in, in the scout movement in, in Finland and all over the world as well. But that is one of the uh, examples where exactly the whole movement has really been ready to change the ways of working together and then ways of building the society and really thinking how we can really get the young people to participate in the future as well. So really reading and being really listening about the tendencies, what is happening in the society. And I think that that's really brave. It's, it's great that, that the organization is not really repeating the messages or, or ways of working like we used to do in 100 years ago, but it's really trying to live in the society and finding the ways that which works, how we can really get the people more involved. And if you carefully listen to that, then, then you really be the success story and you can really have the future as well. Uh, thank you, and I see Aro, you would like to? Uh, it's very many reasons. One is that we were long part of Sweden and after that tradition, for example, the possibility and the value that people can come freely together. That is one of important niin kuin, historical issues. As I mentioned earlier, the second is that education has always been part of civil society. 
that the leaders of Finland understood that we have educated train the so-called normal local people that Finland can success. And third one, Finland was poor country. We had come together, make together in cities, in towns or in countryside that we could survive here in cold north. And one thing is also that earlier, especially earlier, most of the Finnish politicians became from civil society associations. So they have always understand the importance of civil society that they have always supported it. Therefore, for example, we have so excellent financial system in Finland, state funding for associations. Maybe you can say a few words about this excellent financing system because maybe people don't know. So, what? Uh, maybe it's lottery. Of course, we are leaders of the organizations. We are always criticizing that we don't get enough money, but <laughs> but we have to be <laughs> we have to be true. If if you compare to the other world or other European countries, we have excellent system. The lottery companies they are collecting money. People love the gambling also here in Finland. In, Mon in Macau, in Singapore, they go to the syndicates or other. In Finland, they go to the association and civil society. That is the main idea. And it's very important. And we fight very strongly against European <laughs> Union or so who want to liberate this system because we have monopoly system. And that is the key point. So state has monopoly to di uh, to divide this uh, this uh, profit of, from lottery to uh, to the NGOs. Yes, and it's big money. And uh, if I understood, this association is is NGO. It's not private company. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you you talked about very important things as. Uh, uh, reasons or uh, keys of successes, and you would like to Sari to add something? Okay. I'd like to add something, and I also would like to stress the importance of education as an enabler for civil society because that enables citizens to act. Um, and also, I would really like to support um, what you said about trends and how NGOs are very up to the trends. And in Finland, there's also always an aim for modernity, um, a willingness to improve constantly and not to be satisfied with the status quo. But, um, well, a lot of things are pretty good in Finland, but still we wish to challenge them and move forward. And that's something that I think needs to continue as well. And no society should ever be satisfied with how things are now but instead move forward constantly. Yeah. Thank you, Sari. And uh, you all talked about a very important things like these uh, keys of success, like uh, legalization of ways of influence and consensus and dialogue who is, uh, that is a normal standard in society. Yeah, and um, family uh, families that uh, um, raised uh, children in a mood and attitudes of cooperation um, and volunteering and easy access uh, to each other to services and constant analysis of what is happening in, in the society and this ongoing education. Uh, but now I would like to ask uh, our dear participants, uh, you have maybe uh, also questions to our panelists. Yes, please. Lukas, I see. And, mm -hmm. uh, 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 could you say uh, if to understand their uh, success of your civil society via consensus. Could you give a few examples? Uh, for instance, I can uh, give you three areas where you can hardly find consensus. Uh, 
Um, could you could you please uh, give us the examples of how you go about the consensus? Uh, for instance, I can give you three examples, three brief examples. The first one. There are groups which uh, is help migrants, and uh, the other other groups are against migrants, and they do not act violently, but they just do it via some practices. There are also groups that are supporting LG LGBT uh, associations, but and there are groups that are going against these associations and uh, against same-sex uh, marriages. There are groups which are supporting. Um, supporting acts against uh, legislation acts against domestic violence and there are others which are against uh, the criminalization of domestic violence how do you find a consensus if there are such opposite views Um, so if groups contradict with each other, how can they reach consensus? Well, um, there's really a variety of issues here, and these are also related to polarization in society. But I think one key aspect is to target new target audiences. We always direct our messages at a certain somebody, at a certain group of people, which we wish to reach. But... I think that quite often people make the mistake that they always phrase the same issues in the exact same way, which results in them addressing the same people over and over again. For instance, in environmental issues, it's very typical to um, talk about polar bears that don't really have the same influence as social issues or economic benefits. Um, which can also be used to promote renewable energy, for instance. So it's about framing issues in a way that the party you want to address wants to listen to you. And also, if we wish to gain more support for a certain topic, we always have to address a new target audience and change the messages so that they will appeal to a new group of people. Also, another part in this, of course, is since you're listening before you talk, um, you have to listen in order to understand in what way the other side thinks about the issue, um, in order to understand why they feel that way, so that you can then address it in how you rephrase and reframe the topic you want to change. Thank you, Sandy. Would you like to? Okay. Yeah, I can also go uh, Rita, <laughs> would you like to add something? Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure that the consensus is not always reached. And is it then needed? I think not. We can honor each other's opinions and we can work together even if we do not feel the same or think in the same way. So. <laughs> yes. I would also say that um, consensus does not always have to be reached. But more important is the aim for it, because that results in the dialogue, yeah, yeah. that results in the understanding. So mm -hmm. um, if a society always needs absolute consensus, then it ends up in paralysis. It cannot move forward. So um, the aim for it and collaboration and listening to the opinions of others is more important than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. There was Lukas. It was the last question. And you, Misha, will be the next. Lukas? Uh, behind you. No, 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 behind. Lukas Wenerski, I have a question to Sari Nikanen. If you could uh, develop a little bit more of the process of implementation of your initiative in more, you know, practical terms. If you encounter any resistance from a part of the Finnish society and how you could deal with it. You already said a little bit about reaching the consensus, but if you could translate it into, you know, the practical examples, the way you implemented it, and what about the, for, for instance, media coverage, what was, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the perception of media of your initiative? Um, well, 
first of all, I think that's a very broad topic, <laughs> one that I could talk about for a long time, I think. But um, we, like, a part that we were directing our messages to, of course, it always depends whether it was perceived that way, but we were never trying to address those people who actually wanted um, to marry a same-sex partner themselves, but instead um, having like approach that everybody knows somebody for whom this is um, a very crucial issue of their own life. And we, like, perhaps one strategy of reaching consensus and talking to other people who feel um, different about issues is understanding that we share different values, um, but or we have a different balance of values, that's perhaps a right way to say it. Um, quite typically, people on the left end in each culture, they value a lot uh, liberty, being able, like the right to do something, and also equality and fairness, whether, like on the other hand, then um, people on the right side will value loyalty and commitment more. So it's a bit twisting the messages to incorporate the values that the other party um, would support. Thank you very much. I think that you can continue in, in then in, during coffee breaks and, and today. And, but uh, unfortunately, because of time, we need to go to final part of our panel. Marita, floor is yours. Yes, after the <laughs> Okay, thank you, Anna. We shall devote our last 20 minutes to the future, and, and uh, we were lucky because we are just going, <laughs> going to this theme in these last uh, speeches. Uh, which challenges do we have in Finland in front of us now, and, and, uh, and uh, what kind of challenges our civil society is facing nowadays? What are the prospects for the future? And Sari, you have uh, the floor to start. Yes, thank you. So um, my favorite topic absolutely is the polarization of society, as you might have noticed already during this <laughs> panel. Um, but I think what is very important nowadays in the polarization of society is also the role of social media in this, because the social media creates a lot of bubbling of society will be a lot more surrounded in the social media by people who think alike. And we will also receive news that reflect a certain opinion that we already have. So um, the world being more and more online is actually um, a two-sided sword, a two-pointed sword, in that it is increasing this polarization creating more social bubbles, creating news bubbles. And this also results in that we have a lot more negative feelings against the opposing um, or people with opposing opinions. So this is something that's definitely eroding one of the key success factors in Finland and for other societies as well, which is collaboration and dialogue. Um, so I would like to point out a few ways in which this issue can be addressed um, that would be beneficial to decrease polarization. One of them is if you want to talk to, the, um, talk to somebody who has a different viewpoint on things, you should apply the technique of moral reframing. That could be something useful, which basically means that you have to understand that other people will have different values based on which they form their views. So if you can um, talk about renewable energy, for instance, as a form, something that can benefit the country economically, so it can be of economic benefit, then it will attract a completely different part of society than if you talk about, um, for instance, um, the beauty of nature. The, uh, well, there's a, um, a lot of different <laughs> values that can be used. Um, 
Yes, and also I think it's very important that we aim to bridge over these polarized bubbles in social media and elsewhere. And this requires a lot of respect for the opponents as well and the ability to listen what the viewpoint of the other, others will be. And I think this is also very important because every movement creates its counter movement at the same time. And it depends on how we address the political issues that we want to address on what the counter movement will be like afterwards. Um, so if uh, the disagreeing party will feel uh, insulted, then they will um, be a lot more likely to oppose vigorously afterwards than if they feel that they were engaged in an open dialogue. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Sari. <laughs> Maybe Rita, you could uh, go on. Uh, yes, uh, I, I agree with that, um, with that polarization and what, what happens in this society and uh, what will it then lead in the future. Um, that, that might cause some, some uh, difficulties or troubles in the... In the NGO life as well, but um, uh, actually I'm quite positive still, uh, seeing, seeing the future quite positive, and, and even if I'm pretty sure that there are going to be some cuts of funding, um, especially for those who have already settled for, for a certain level of funding or so, so maybe there's going to be some, some changes in, in, in that sense as well, uh, but still I, as I said, I'm quite positive in that sense that uh, the more uh, the NGOs or, or their existence is questionized, I think that the, the more they need to focus on that, that what they are actually established for, what, what is the main goal of them, and maybe it also creates some new ways of, of acting, new ways of influencing, and, uh, and uh, maybe the NGOs also see it more clearly the role of, of as an influence maker and, and to try to uh, create new ways. But then, then of course, the, the question which I meet in, in my daily life in my own NGO is that social media and, and the use of it, uh, I think it's the question of, of, um, of um, I lost, lost the words, but uh, it's it's pretty much the the, the question of, of your age, and um, as you can see, I'm not the, the the most youngest one anymore. And of course, I use social media, but because I need to do that because I'm working in there, and uh, and uh, uh, I think that 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 is going to be. I would not like to emphasize that it's going to be some sort of a critical point, but it's gonna make some sort of a um, some sort of a line there for those who actually are very active and, and think that the NGO life is, is only there, living only there in the social media. And I think that there are already in many, many of that kind of NGOs, for example, here in Finland, who do that, who have everything that is happening in those NGOs is there in social media. And then there are those... Um, um, I wouldn't like to say it older ones, but, but people who are not so used to use that and who still would like to, to act in a, in a more, um, in, in that way that has been used for, for, for the last decades. And, and I think that that's going to be an interesting issue in the future as well. Okay, thank you, Rita. And Aaro, what do you think about challenges? We have more than 100,000 associations and so we have about one million people who are working in responsibility positions in associations and we have nearly one million people who are working regularly making voluntary work. Uh, I have worked 38 years in civil society and on that experience I think that this is the most important thing how people in future are taking part to this kind of positions. Are they ready 
to take that kind of responsibilities in associations because, because restricted, uh, registered, excuse, excuse, registered associations and voluntary work are the main issues in Finnish civil society. So people have to take responsibility, make active work in associations or in voluntary work. What are the values of Finnish people? Now we have seen signs that people want to take part to different kind of activities, but they are not as so eager as earlier to take, for example, chairperson position, secretary position, financial person position in associations. This is, I think this is very important issue. Or are they ready to work regularly in voluntary activities? Or do they want spontaneously make voluntary work? Okay, really, what do you think about challenges? I think many of those points, what I, I was thinking has, has been said, I, I think it's, it's quite in the interesting situation at the moment because uh, there are so many Finns who want to participate somehow, but it looks like, like Ar just said, that people don't really have time to commit. The, those who have workplaces, they have the jobs, they are extremely busy on their, their job issues, so it's more than just for the working hours. So the, the uh, expectations for that is, is so high, plus they are going to take care of their kids and, and many elderly people, their parents, etc. So, so especially those young families, they are really, really in the rush hours of, of the life at the moment. And in that kind of circumstance, it's very difficult to to really take the more responsibilities and really commit yourself. And I think the, the failure of the NGOs, the traditional NGOs, is also that perhaps we are still asking a little bit more. We, we don't really understand about the realities of, of the people. So people also feel that they, they don't want to commit because if, I, if I'm committing, I need to do that 150%. So that is the, a little bit on the, some kind of philosophy. The expectations are so high that when you are in, you are totally in. You don't really have some kind of semi-version that you can be partly in, but you need to be really, really in. And, and that's why I think that the young people, they don't really feel very committed to join in the traditional NGOs, but they want to just have a, whatever activism, they, they would like to join in the movements, which they can go and come. So it's a little bit more flexible, and you can go and participate and do but you can commit yourself for the shorter term, and then you can just jump out on that and perhaps joining on the other activities. Not really having those heavy, some kind of responsibilities in, in that way. And I, I think that that's a big challenge in the NGOs at the moment, that we need to really think about that, how we can be more flexible, how we can really read better about the changes in the society. So that's, that's one, one issue. Another one is the social media, which all of us, we are tackling, we love it and we hate it at the same time. Because it's, it's really, there's a beauty of that, that you can really, really get a lot of people informed what's happening and, and it's quite easy access to participate. But at the same time, it's feeding in more on the populist issues and it's, it's easy to just send 140 letters just to say that what I'm thinking about that and that. And, and when the people are reading the messages how from their, based on their own thinking and their own values and own stereotypes or whatever, there's huge opportunity for the misunderstandings. And that's really increased a lot of mess, as, as we know, on, on that. So how to really handle that in the more um, sophisticated way? It's really the challenge for, for all, all of us. And I, I, I think that the, what Rita mentioned about this age issue is an issue in, in Finland, because we have the tendency at the moment that uh, first time ever in the Finnish history, we are in the situation that we have um, uh, the more the people are more dying than, than we are going to have the newcomers in, in the Finnish situation at the moment. So it will really change the whole um, pyramid of the population at the moment. And I, I think that we need to really understand these changes in the society 
so that we can really keep on those good elements what we used to have in, in the Finnish society, where the NGOs has been really the fundamental blood of, of the whole society. So there are really the big challenges at, at the moment. And perhaps the last point concerning for, for this um, luxury situation that we have got the funding from the governments, many of the NGOs in many sectors I'm saying this now a little bit in the crude way, but that we have used to get the funding also from the from the government, because as from the historical level, majority of the politicians, the decision makers, they have their own roots in in the civil society and and the NGOs, and this is fundamental blood. It's it's from our point of view, it's it's healthy part of the society that there are taxpayers' money to be giving for the civil society, They're doing different kind of roles giving the, uh, and being the service uh, provider, but also the watchdog, also the doing the educational side of, of, the, um, of the society, and many, many, many other roles. And this is really the fundamental part of the whole society to move on and in, and in really building the future for us. And now when this funding has been questioned, and it's not just for, for, for those who are working in the, in the global side or, or the international work, there, there are also heavy cuts in, in the education side, for example, and many, many other areas. And I think that it's, it's, it could be just for the small part of, of the support from the government side, but in principle level, it's, it's a really strong message that something in this whole understanding how the whole nation has been built on and how the healthy society works, it's, it's really the heavy message which is really coming now from the government. And, and I think that we need to really accommodate that as well as NGOs. We need to really have a better analysis how much is really affecting in, in our role and, and rightly, like Rita said, that we need to really come back to that roots, what really is the main objectives of our existence. It's really important to go that through. But there are many of the civil society organizations who are living this pain practically mm -hmm. through at the moment. And this is what I'm witnessing all, all the time every day in, in my life. And I think that it's, it's interesting to see that what is happening in a couple of years what really are the results? Because still we are a little bit on, on this fragile or some kind of uh, bruises, not, to, not really yet in with all the results. Thank you, really, and thanks all, all the panelists for these uh, very good inputs. Now we shall uh, have some 10 minutes left, and, and we want to discuss with you now. So Anna has promised to moderate this last 10 minutes. Yes. Please, Anna. I see you, but there is also a young man behind you, and I <laughs> promise to him that he can ask what he wanted to ask, but please, short. Correct. It's, huh, it's a little bit strange to me, after all um, conclusions. I'm not so brave, I will speak Russian. Uh, my, Ruski. my questions are... Just two questions. What part of the lottery proceeds go to non-profits in your country? What part of the lottery proceeds go to non-profits? And my second question. In Russia, there is an institution designed uh, to represent the interest of the entire uh, civil society, the so-called civic chamber. The civic chambers of uh, in different regions are formed by society, and uh, um, they are uh, established by government, and they are supposed to represent civil society. Is there anything like that in the Finnish uh, society? How big percentage uh, gets uh, NGOs from Rahis? And the second question is, if you, if you do have some representative structure as public ch chamber in Russian Federation is a representative of uh, civil society, at least state set uh, um, at, at this way. The lottery company, they give money uh, very much for sport, youth work, social and health work, and culture and art. 
this, uh, uh, this lady has been member of this board. It is 600 million per year, something like that, because both companies are 300 year, 300, about 600 million per year. And plus government is giving tax money for example, for my organization, which is educational organization, or to KEHUS, which is working in, in development activities and so on. So it's huge money. <laughs> and the second, question, the second question is that state, I know quite well the Finnish civil society history, but I'm not sure, but I think that State has never founded any association in Finland. People have founded it and they have possibility to act freely and state and municipalities has financial supported. This is our history and our tradition and this has been big, big value in Nordic countries. Thank you, Aro. Sorry. Would you like to add something? Um, okay, if it's if it's important, yeah, please. Well, um, I just like to add to the previous comment of the panelists um, about um, the social media still, how it's very difficult sometimes, um, also because of this information. So that one tool to address this is also the transparency and openness of information. Because if there is no open communication, then rumors will spread easily. But if the government and other parties will communicate openly and transparently about what they are doing and what has been decided and um, get the data out there, then this information will be a lot less and this will then decrease the dysfunctioning parts of social media or online societies. Okay, thank you. And the last question, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Rauno Marisari. I'm a government guy, but please don't worry. <laughs> um, um, we have uh, tens of thousands of Russian speakers in Finland currently. Anna knows figures more than me. Many of them are um, Finnish citizens. Could you tell me a little bit, little bit about their engagement in the civil society? How much they are some way having their own bubbles, Russian-speaking organizations? And, and for instance, how many Russian speakers you have, Sari, or really in your organizations? Thank you. Yeah, if I can start. So... Um in our network, uh, we have uh, three or four uh, Russian speakers network, not Russian speakers associations networks. But uh, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I can't give any any exact number of of, of the people actually uh, engaged by uh, by that. But uh, what the difficulty is that those Russian uh, communities, they have some difficulties to work with each other. They, more often, they have difficulties to work with each other more than with the others. Like, they have more difficult... Uh, I just need to say this aloud, because you ask for that. So, <laughs> and uh, that, that is <laughs> quite an issue in our network as well. We have been discussing about that. Where is, does it come from? And uh, is it because of that that uh, Russians, they are so many here, that they can actually live in their own bubbles in an easy way. And uh, maybe then the collaboration um, is not so easy. I'm, I do not know where it, does it come from, but, but that is pretty much the case that, that quite often the Russians, they have easier to work with, uh, with uh, people from Mexico or wherever, but not with the other Russians. Thank you, Rita. And maybe really or Yeah, perhaps I can concretize our cooperation with the Russians here today. This is, this is one of the examples why we want to really build the bridges between the Finnish civil society organizations and the Russians ones. 
So that is really the extremely good exercise, what, and that's why we are so happy to, to join and, and being the local partner on implementing on, on that. And one of our aim really is that hopefully this event is really helping to building the bridges and finding the partnerships between the Finnish and, and the Russian civil society and, and of course the, all the other ones as well. So that's, that's our aim as, as a platform. We are representing, we are the member's own platform for working for, for the uh, really promoting of the global values and, and working and following the uh, global policies on, on that and definitely our one of part of our, our role is really to facilitate and coordinate and bring together the different organizations. So that's that's one one aim. And I can shortly mention this you as well that we will exactly we just got the positive funding um, um, news that we will continue this this work as well uh, together with Anna and, and other colleagues. So this is really an open invitation. So please join. Thank you. Thank you. It's a wonderful conclusion. And before I pass uh, the word to Marita to f appreciate speakers and to uh, finish, I would like to uh, share with you one uh, very small story. Um, uh, several years ago, we organized in St. Petersburg seminar for Finnish and Russian women's NGOs. And during the introduction, uh, our Finnish colleague, she uh, told uh, the first time in her life uh, she told that her uh, grandfather and grandmother were Russians. They lived in Moscow, and in 1917, her grandfather uh, lost everything, and they moved to Finland, to Helsinki. And grandfather was very depressed because he didn't speak Finnish. He didn't have anything. Uh, he didn't know how to feed family. And uh, grandmother uh, was also sad, but she thought, but what can we do? And uh, she thought he, she never worked before and she thought but I can play the card she played uh, cards very well and she started to play cards for money <laughs> and uh, soon in short time uh, she uh, gathered a good amount of money and they bought a shop of, of sewing goods it's this Hader, Hader Bashery, uh sewing um, these um, goods um, and uh, so they uh, get much better and uh, <laughs> grandfather also um, uh, um, got healthy and um, things uh, went better and uh, she finished uh, finish that uh, from my grandmother, I learned that women uh, can do everything. And she became one of the leaders of uh, Finnish NGOs and internationally, internationally known. So it's a very nice example how we are interconnected. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. That was a nice uh, end for our our panel discussion. I hope you have got uh, some ideas to go on uh, the, uh, discussions on the coffee break. But before that, I want to thank you, panelists. You were great. And a special thanks thank you. to you, Sari, because I think you, you represent the next generation. And, and if we look at and listen, listen to you, so I think the future will be good. Thank you, especially That's for great. you. <laughs> and thank you, Anna. You have been the soul of this Finnish-Russian uh, civil society uh, network and all that uh, work yeah. together. Yeah. Thank you. Kitos, Maria. Thank to you all. Spasiba, gromne vsem. Thank you. 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 Thank you.